Well, hello and welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams. I'm here with my co-host, Billy Thomas, and we both work in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources um, in the Extension Department. And um, we are once again have the show that's back to back to back. And so uh, we're going to get started really quick here. <laughs> Yeah, Renee, I'm really excited about today's show. We've got a special guest coming in and joining us, a um, park naturalist actually mm -hmm. from the city of Lexington here um, at Raven Run, and she's going to be talking here in a moment. We also have our wildlife sound with Dr. Matt Springer, um, Tree of the Week, and a special announcement about Master Naturalist program that a few of our um, team members are working on. So I'm really excited. I'm glad to have you all with us today. Um, as a reminder, you can interact with us via the chat pod. Um, via Zoom. And if you're joining us via Facebook Live, um, please leave comments and we will respond as quickly as possible. Definitely. So let's get started because we've, I know we say this every week, Billy, but we really do have a cram packed show. So um, we'd like to introduce Anna and if she wants to turn on her video and uh, her audio for us. Um, she is a park naturalist at Raven Run and we greatly appreciate you coming on to speak about winter wildlife treats. Good. Definitely appreciate you all having me on. So tell us a little bit about what we're going to see today. Sure. So basically um, what I'm going to talk about today is just a little bit of an introduction to getting into winter bird feeding. Uh, we're all kind of stuck at home right now. It's winter time. There's not a lot going on even outside. Um, so this is a great thing to get into right now, you know, this time of year. And you can definitely get into it and get really serious about backyard bird feeding and spend hundreds of dollars and, you know, be sitting in front of your window all the time. Like, um, <laughs> but this is just a, a, you know, kind of an easy, uh, inexpensive way to get into it and see if it's something that you enjoy. Um, and it's also a great thing if you have kids in the house, if you have kids in your life, um, this is, you know, a great opportunity to kind of engage them with the natural world and, and, you know, get them crafting and, and, you know, sort of engaging in some hands-on activities, so. Wonderful. Well, awesome. Right. Let's, let's check let's it out. Let's watch that. <laughs> yeah, so. Hello, friends. My name is Anna, and I work out at Raven Run Nature Sanctuary in Southern Fayette County. You probably already guessed this from the video title, but we are going to be talking today about winter wildlife feeding. We are going to be talking about why it's useful, why it's helpful to the wildlife in your community, and some tips and tricks to help you get started. Well, there's other wildlife that's probably going to come around if you're providing food, Birds are something that everyone has as part of their community, and they're one of the easiest animals to attract to your outdoor space. Birds are that one group of wildlife that we all have as neighbors, whether you live in the middle of town in an apartment, or whether you live out in the middle of nowhere in the woods. So today we are gonna focus mostly on birds and how you can turn your outdoor space into your community's premier bird restaurant. So why feed the birds? Well, first of all, birds have been around since long before bird feeders were invented. So as you might have guessed, they don't really need for us to feed them, but it does help them out. Think of a time when you were super cold and tired and maybe you'd had a long day of working outside or a long day at school and you just wanted an easy meal without having to go home and cook it. Bird feeders are kind of like stopping by a restaurant on your way home and picking up a hot meal where you don't have to put in a lot of work for it. Feeding birds does make it easier for them to conserve their energy during cold weather and it's a great place for them to stop by for a meal if everything else is covered in snow. So how are you gonna create a winter wildlife feeding station that is going to make your local birds actually wanna stop by and check it out? First of all, think about what types of food you're gonna be offering. The bird seed that you can buy in your local dollar store, grocery store, or other place near your home is probably good enough for most of the birds that you are going to see in your area. Most of those bird seeds that you're gonna buy from the store contain a mix of three or more different seeds. They have black oil, sunflower seed, millet, and milo. And that's pretty much enough for most of the birds to find something that they like in that mix. Sometimes you'll see mixes with some other things thrown in like safflower seed or thistle seed. And those are pretty popular with specific kinds of birds too, like goldfinches love thistle seed. Secondly, think about how you're gonna be offering that food. Again, you can probably check out many of the stores in your area and find a bird feeder that works for you for not too much money. A specialty store like Wild Birds Unlimited is also a great option. They're going to have a really big assortment of feeders so you can find something that you really like and works for your space. And they will have experts on hand who can help you choose something that's gonna work for you. If you're feeling crafty though, consider spending some time making your own bird feeders. 
It's cheap and fun, and it's a great way to decorate your outdoor space for the winter. And you don't really need anything other than bird seed and some items that you probably already have around your house. First up is the classic pine cone bird feeder. You may have done this before or seen it before, and it's pretty easy. Birds love it because it looks very natural and it's perfect for a holiday themed bird tree in your outdoor space. You'll need a pine cone, string, bird seed, and something that you're gonna use to stick the bird seed to the pine cone. I used peanut butter. You could also use coconut oil or sunflower butter. Needless to say, if you're allergic to peanut butter, don't use that. Luckily, there are lots of options though. First, you're gonna grab the string, tie it around the top of your pine cone, and that will be the loop that you hang the feeder from. Next, grab some kind of utensil and start spreading peanut butter, sunflower butter, or coconut oil, whatever you're using, all over the pine cone. Work it in there as best as you can. The more that you have on there, the better your seed will stick. And also, it makes a great source of protein for birds on a cold day. Once you've gotten your pine cone as peanut buttery, sunflower buttery, or coconut oily as you can, then you're gonna go ahead and roll it around in the bird seed. Get as much of the seed as you can to stick to the pine cone. Really, the more the better. And you're gonna be putting this in the freezer, so don't worry if it seems like it's not going to stick very well. Once it's frozen, it will stick a lot better. It doesn't matter if it's pretty or not. Birds aren't picky, and believe me, I've seen some birds eating some pretty gross things. Once you've finished however many pine cones you'd like to make, set them aside in a bowl or plate so you can put them in the freezer later on. All right, next we are going to be making some bird seed cakes. These are pretty easy as well. You're just going to need your bird seed, a bowl to mix with, a paper cup, some string, and whatever you decided to use before to make your bird seed stick to the pine cones. Remember, you don't want to use peanut butter if you're allergic to it, but keep in mind that sunflower butter and coconut oil are great substitutes. First of all, cut a piece of string about a foot long or so. It doesn't need to be exact, but this will be the hanger for your bird feeder. So you want it to be long enough that you'll be able to loop it around a branch or something like that. Secondly, grab someone to help you out and poke a hole in the bottom of your paper cup as close to the middle as you can get it. Next, you're just going to take your string and run it through the hole in the bottom of your cup. If you've ever made a telephone out of a string and a paper cup before, then you already know exactly how to do this. Then take the loose end of your string that's on the bottom side of the cup and tie a big old knot in there. You want it to be big enough that when you flip the cup over and pull on the string, you aren't able to pull it out through the hole in the bottom. Now for the messy part. Set your cup aside and grab a bowl to mix in. You're gonna put about equal parts bird seed and your peanut butter, coconut oil, or sunflower oil, depending on what you're using, into the bowl and mix it up. You want it to be about the consistency of cookie dough, so don't be afraid to add more of either ingredient after you're done mixing it until it looks right to you. It's not an exact science, so don't worry if yours doesn't look exactly the same as mine does. Next, grab your paper cup and start filling it with your bird seed mixture. It's gonna be a little bit difficult because you have the string in your way, but don't worry about it too much. Again, it doesn't need to look perfect. The birds will not mind at all and they will still think it's delicious. As you're putting the bird seed mixture into your cup, stop every few spoonfuls and move the string back into the middle of the cup. Once you've got it completely filled up, smooth it out, make sure the string is centered, and you're good to go. If you'd like, you can go ahead and tie a loop in the loose end of your string, and that will just make it easier when your bird feeder is ready to place outside. Go ahead and set the bird seed cake aside with your pine cones. This is another one that needs to go in the freezer before you should put it outside. Also, I used a little paper cup for mine, but you can really use any size or shape of paper cup that you have on hand. For our next bird feeder, we're going to be making something for those bird species that would much rather eat fruit than bird seed. For this, you're gonna need a stick or a pine cone some string, some fruit, of course, I chose apples and oranges, and an adult who can help you slice the fruit up. Have your adult slice the fruit like this. You can really do it any way that you want to, and you're probably catching on by now that it doesn't need to look beautiful for birds to like it. 
I like to cut mine like this though, just because that kind of leaves a good spot for you to start threading them onto the bird feeder, as you'll see in a minute. Next, go ahead and tie your sticker pine cone to one end of the string. This will give birds something to perch on while they're stopping by for a fruit snack. Next, grab your fruit slices. You're going to thread them one on top of the other onto the string, pushing them all the way down to the pine cone. You can see because of the way I cut my apples and oranges that they kind of have an easy spot to thread the string through, right in the middle of the orange and where the core of the apple was. If you don't see this in the fruit that you're using, that's no big deal. Just have an adult help you by using a knife to make a small hole in each piece of fruit so you can thread your string through it. Once you're done threading all of the fruit onto your string, then you can go ahead and tie a loop in the end that is going to make it easier when it comes time for you to put your feeder outside. This bird feeder doesn't need to go in the freezer like the previous two, but you may want to go ahead and put it in the refrigerator to keep it fresh while you're working on the other feeders. That way you can put them out all together at the same time. If you've gotten to this point and you're still feeling crafty, I have one more feeder that you might want to make. This one is gonna take a little bit more time and a few more supplies. You're going to need a bowl, an old coffee cup or other cup with a handle, some bird seed, your peanut butter or sunflower butter or coconut oil, some string, some glue, and a nice stick. You'll also need an adult to help you out with the glue. You need to use something strong. I prefer a hot glue gun, but you can also use super glue if you have that on hand instead. So definitely get an adult to help you out with that aspect. The first thing that you're going to do is to take your old coffee mug and have your adult put a line of glue on it opposite the handle. Then hold the stick in place until the glue is dry. Be sure to be careful not to glue your fingers to anything. This will be the perch when your bird feeder is finished. Next, you're gonna go ahead and cut some string. And yes, I know my string is a huge mess. You're going to want three or four feet of string don't worry too much though about getting it exact because you can always cut off any extra string or tie on some more if you need it. Next, put a little spot of glue somewhere on your coffee mug, just wherever you'd like to start the string from, and then just start wrapping the string around your coffee mug. This is going to make it look prettier and it's gonna also give the birds a little bit of something to grip onto when they land on it since the coffee mug just by itself is pretty slippery. If you need to, you can add some little spots of glue here and there to keep the string from slipping around on the coffee mug as you're wrapping it. If you run out of string and you still want more of your bird feeder to be covered, then just tie some more onto the loose end. All right, so we are back at it with making some bird seed cookie dough. You're going to need your peanut butter, coconut oil, or your sunflower butter. You're just gonna mix it all up like you did before until it has the consistency of cookie dough and then you are going to spoon it carefully into your bird feeder, packing it in with the back of your spoon. The coffee mug doesn't need to be full. In fact, it's probably better if it's not because then there's less chance of some of your cookie dough falling out onto the ground and going to waste. For the finishing touch, of course, make a hanger for your bird feeder out of an extra piece of string. You can just tie it in a loop and then fasten it around the handle of your coffee mug and that will make it easy for you to hang it on a tree branch or a nail near your window. So now that you've finished making however many of these bird feeder suggestions you'd like to, or maybe even come up with some of your own, go ahead and put your creations into the fridge or the freezer overnight so they have a chance to harden and get a little less messy. All right, so I'm back and I have lots of peanut butter in my hair. Now that we are done creating our bird feeders, let's talk about what's next. Once you've put your bird feeders out into your outdoor space and they've started to attract some birds, you may want to learn to identify them. If you don't want to spend money on a book, that's okay. There are a lot of free resources available on the internet. One of the best ones, in my opinion, is actually an app that you can download onto your phone. It's called Merlin Bird ID and it's put out by the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology. It's super user-friendly and you really don't have to know anything about birds to start identifying them using the Merlin app. Merlin basically guides you through a bird's identification by asking you questions about its size, its shape, any markings it had, and when and where you saw it. It also has lots of pictures for you to look at and it has some recordings of different bird vocalizations if you'd like to learn bird songs and calls. 
Once you're feeling kind of confident in your bird ID skills, you can start contributing to our knowledge of bird populations by joining in on a citizen science project. A great one to get involved with is Project Feeder Watch, put on again by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. If you'll visit their website and the link in the description, you'll see that they have a lot of information about joining the program, identifying birds, and collecting data on what is visiting your feeder. If you'd like some practice identifying birds and you're still waiting for your local birds to find the feeders that you put out for them, you can practice your identification skills by visiting the Project Feeder Watch live cam that the Cornell Laboratory of Ornithology puts up on their page. The link for the Project Feeder Watch feeder cam will be in the description below as well, and I definitely recommend checking that out. I'm also going to go ahead and put links to our Facebook page and our websites in the description. We're happy to help if you have any questions about birds or bird feeding, and we would love to see some pictures of your new bird restaurant. Well, thank you so much for that presentation. That was, that was really neat. I really enjoyed watching that. Um, so Anna, one thing I noticed, so do you leave the cups on the, with the mini cups and the big cups after you freeze them, do you leave those on to kind of catch the, the food or do you actually take it off? I go ahead and tear it off because I think it just makes the food a little bit more accessible to the birds. Um, you could probably leave it on and they would figure out how to perch on it and, you know, eat out of it if you were worried about it kind of melting or, um, you know, the birds possibly kind of tearing it apart and wasting some food. Mm -hmm. uh, a big concern with the, with the peanut butter or the sunflower butter or, you know, that type of thing. Um, in the wintertime, especially in Kentucky, where a lot of the time it's 20 degrees one day and then the next day it's 50 degrees, um, is that you don't want those types of feeders to be out when it's too warm because all of the, um, what, you know, whatever type of, of ingredient you've used, the peanut butter, uh, will actually start getting soft and kind of melting. And then you don't want the birds to get that into their feathers. Um, so if you were worried about that, you might want to leave the cup on and, you know, kind of lessen their exposure to the peanut butter. Yeah. Yeah. Cause some of them, I can see that little, the smaller cup might be harder for them to actually get around and get into. Yeah. If you, mm -hmm. if you did. Okay. And I really enjoyed how, um, you, you broke it down so simply and it can be such a great family activity, right? A really great way to kind of bring some of our youth in and, getting them experience and enjoying the outdoors. So really, really nice. Thank you so much for those. For sure. Yeah, I think this one is an awesome, awesome project to do with kids because it gets them excited about, um, you know, the real life animals that could show up at this cool thing they made. And also pretty much every kid that I've ever encountered really loves like a grown up basically telling them like, hey, here, you can make as big of a mess as you want. Like, <laughs> let's let's do this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, kids usually really, really enjoy this project. Well, I was wondering, do you have to be careful for the seeds that you get that they don't or that they don't end up coming up in your yard if they get down in the ground? Or do you not have to worry about that? The birds will end up eating it. <laughs> oh, so I would say definitely, um, you know, if you are hanging your bird feeder in a place where that's a concern, I would definitely keep an eye on it because I've had um, all kinds of sunflower and millet and, and, you know, pretty much everything come up under my bird feeders. So if you're hanging them in a place where that might be a concern for you, I definitely keep an eye out for it. Um, but you can just let them grow if you're not worried about it, you know, and then you have some awesome free sunflowers into the, into the bargain. Exactly. And do you have, um, I see that someone put the Merlin bird ID is free in the app store. Um, but you know, if they're going to see all these birds, they might actually want to know what kind they are. So um, is that the best place to go to get that kind of information? I think that Merlin is a really great way for a lot of people to start, um, especially if you are doing this as an activity with kids. You know, a lot of kids are maybe more used to interacting with a screen than a physical book, like a field guide, uh, especially right now, we're all kind of doing things on screens. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's pretty user friendly for adults and kids both. And it really leads you through the identification based on things that you can see like size and shape and color uh, versus a paper field guide, which is more than likely going to be in taxonomic order, which is kind of confusing if you know it's something that you're not used to. Right. Um, so I think Merlin is a really, really great resource. Um, you know, you can always just start as well by getting on the internet um, and just Googling common birds of Kentucky and then 
you know, it might not lead to the correct species 100% of the time, but if, you know, you start out at like 80%, right, then, uh, you know, I, I think that that's a pretty good place to start. So I, I would say that um, anything that you can, you can do that sort of simplifies it, at least in the beginning, right. uh, like the Merlin bird ID app is a really good way to start. Um, we did have a standpoint that you don't want to overwhelm yourself or right. you know, we did have a question come in is the Merlin app better than the Peterson app do you know um I think it depends on where you're coming from and kind of what your previous experience is mm -hmm. if I'm not mistaken the Peterson app is um one that you pay for so I I think that the Merlin app for that reason and for you know, kind of the way that it leads you through the identification is better for people who are maybe just starting out. Mm -hmm. uh, but I really think any amount of resources that you can have, you know, the more the better, yeah. especially as you go kind of further along and in, in backyard bird feeding and birding in general. Um, okay. But I would start with the Merlin Bird ID app if this is kind of your first venture into bird watching, because, you know, it's free and it's, it's very user friendly. Right. Uh, and as you mentioned, there are so many bird watching and, and bird feeder resources out there. A quick Google search and you will be overwhelmed yes. um, with a lot of information. But it, again, it's a great way to kind of get people engaged in our natural world. So um, Anna, thanks so much for sharing that great video with us. Today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Awesome. All right. Yeah, so now we're still going to keep going with the show, but we're going mm -hmm. to kind of switch gears from birds for a few moments. Um, and we're going to talk about our tree of the week. Yeah, great. Um, I, I wanted to just to say thank you, Anna, for coming on today for the show. And I popped in the uh, chat pod, the Project Feeder Watch link, and the Great Backyard Bird Count, which is coming up in February, the link for that as well. So um, thanks again, Anna. Um, but to switch gears, talking about trees, um, this week I picked out a tree that I think has really, it's very unique and a lot of winter um, appeal. And it's the honey locust. So here we go with honey locust. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resource Extension. And I'm here with the tree of the week, the honey locust. Honey locust, Gladizia triacanthos, is also known as sweet locust or thorny locust. It's in the Fabaceae or pea family, and the Gladizia genus, which numbers about 12 different species, are scattered throughout North and South America, Central Asia, and Tropical Africa. In the United States, there are two species, honey locust and water locust. It is a moderately fast-growing, relatively short-lived tree, living only to about 125 years. It's a medium-sized tree that grows 70 to 80 feet tall and about 2 to 3 feet in diameter. It typically has a rather short trunk and a narrow spreading canopy. Honey locust is classified as shade intolerant and can be considered weedy or invasive um, around pasture lands. Honey locust is found in the south central and lower midwestern states. It's found throughout Kentucky where soils are derived from limestone. Honey locust grows best on moist bottomland, limestone soils, but is considered hardy and drought resistant and tolerates a variety of conditions. Because it is so tolerant of a variety of growing conditions and it transplants easily and offers a light canopy that still allows grass to grow beneath it, the thornless varieties have been widely planted and overused in urban areas. The leaves of honey locust are alternately arranged on the twig. They are 5 to 8 inches long and they are either pinnately compound with 15 to 30 leaflets or bipinnately compound with 4 to 7 pairs of minor leaflets. The leaflets are small, 1 half to 1 and a half inches long and oval to elliptical in shape with smooth margins. The leaflets are green to yellow green during the growing season and fall color is an attractive yellow but leaves drop early in the fall. The flowers are smallish, greenish yellow and hang in two to three inch long clusters. They are very fragrant but not nearly as showy as black locust flowers. The flowers emerge after the leaves in late spring to early summer. And the flowers are pollinated by, by a variety of pollinating insects such as bees. The honey locust fruit is a twisted legume or pod that typically grows 7 to 18 inches long. 
The legumes or pods have a leathery texture and are greenish when unripe, ripening to a reddish brown or purplish color. Fruit ripens around mid-October and begin to fall, and this may continue throughout the winter. Each pod contains numerous bean-like seeds that are less than half an inch long. The seeds are separated in the pod by a sweet, flavorful pulp, hence the tree's common name, honey locust. The sweet pods are eaten by a variety of, of wildlife and livestock, which assist with seed dispersal. Birds also help disperse seeds to a limited extent. The seeds, like most legumes, have a hard seed coat and can remain viable for a long time. Seed germination is thought to be enhanced when the seeds pass through the birds' and mammals' digestive systems. Trees begin seed production around 10 years of age, with best production between 25 and 75 years. They will generally bear fruit every year with abundant seed crops every two years. The bark of honey locust is gray to brown and smooth with horizontal lenticels when the tree is young. As the tree ages, the bark breaks into long, narrow, curling plates. The bark will often have large clusters of many branched thorns on the trunk, and this is an excellent identifying characteristic of honey locust in the field. Honey locust thorn production usually diminishes in the upper and outer crown growth as the tree ages, but thorns may still be produced in the lower on the lower trunk and on the limb sprouts. Honey locust wood is heavy and dense. The heartwood is medium to light reddish brown and the sapwood is light yellow in color. Honey locust is ring porous, which means that the wood has large pores or vessels in the early wood, that's the wood that's formed in the early part of the growing season, and smaller pores in the late wood, the wood that's formed in the later part of the growing season, of one growth ring. Ring pore structure is mainly present in regions with distinct seasons. Honey locust has three to five rows of large to very large early wood pores, and medium to small late wood pores, commonly arranged in tangential bands. The wood is similar in appearance to Kentucky coffee tree. It's rated as moderately durable to durable, but susceptible to insect attacks. Honey locust is a relatively valuable tree for livestock and wildlife. The pods are a relatively high protein mast that is eaten by cattle, goats, and hogs. Wildlife, including white-tailed deer, possum, squirrel, and northern bobwhite eat the pods as well. And the flowers are a source of pollen and nectar for honey. Honey locust is a valuable tree for agroforestry systems where it's commonly planted as windbreaks and for soil erosion. There are many popular cultivars that have been widely used for shade trees in our urban settings. The cultivars are typically thornless and most do not produce fruit. The wood is used locally for posts, pallets, crates, and general construction and firewood, but it's too scarce to be of great economic importance. The national champion honey locust is in Beautort, Virginia. It's 247 inches in circumference, 103 feet tall, with a 112 foot crown spread. The Kentucky champion honey locust is in Jefferson County. It's 74 inches in circumference, 94 feet tall, with a 50 foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest Champion Trees, or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about honey locust. Honey locust has been widely used as a replacement for the American elm in our urban landscapes. Unlike most legumous species, honey locust does not appear to form rhizobium nodules on its roots, so it doesn't fix atmospheric nitrogen like black locust does. The pulp was used as food to make medicine and tea by Native Americans. In Florida, honey locust was referred to as the Confederate pin tree because the thorns were used to pin together uniforms during the Civil War. The thorns were also once used in carding wool and to pin up wool sacks. The scientific genus name Gleditzia is for the German botanist Gottlieb Gleditsch, and the species name Triacanthos is from the Greek trace and Akinatha, which means three spine, in reference to the thorns. Thanks for joining me to learn about the honey locust and I hope you get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, local park or neighborhood and enjoy this unique tree. Well, thank you, Lori, for doing that. We greatly appreciate that. And remember everybody, if you have any questions, type them in the chat pod or in the comment section on Facebook. And um, Lori, is there a thorn thornless variety of this tree? There's actually a lot of varieties um, that they've 
been selected because they are thornless and they also a lot of them don't produce fruit but the main one that we think of is the um variety enormous i think that's how you pronounce it i'm not the best at sometimes in pronunciation as you notice the, the <laughs> i don't know i think you've been doing great so. uh, i think it's fine <laughs> Um, but that's the one that we see, I know, especially around Lexington, and it is just planted all over the place. It's a very widely used urban tree, overused urban tree um, in that sense. Um, but yes, yeah, so there is that. That is the, the main one you think about is the uh, Enormous, the variety Enormous. But it's other than that, it's Glavidia tricanthos. Now, Laurie, you mentioned the, the, I guess the pulp in there near the seeds was um, <laughs> very sweet and prized. Is it edible for humans or will it make yes. us thick? Oh, yep. okay. No, it is. As you noticed earlier in there, um, in the video, I talk about how Native Americans actually used it as food. They'd make teas and medicine from it. And, you know, livestock enjoy it as well. So, yes, it is edible. Unlike some of our others, like black locusts and stuff is not edible. So, Ooh, we had uh, Shad Baker who said he's had a long piece of a thorn break off in his scalp while deer hunting. And it's like, pretty rough I can imagine those yeah. look pretty bad they yeah, pretty spiky are. there <laughs> they are it, it, it's just one of those trees that it's an easy one to identify because of the thorns and that's why I picked it out it's got interesting winter appeal because even without leaves that tree really stands out so and I was gonna say Raven Run Nature Sanctuary there's a bunch of them down there and that was my oh. first encounter with that I think on one of our tree um tree walks with dendrology and it was like I'll remember that tree yeah. Not one you want to lean up against, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, Lori, thank you for doing this every week. We greatly appreciate it. Absolutely. Well, I enjoy it. Thank you. Yeah. And Laura, I think we're, we're going to talk about a little. We are. Else. So you might as well stay on. <laughs> and we also get um, Dr. Ellen Crocker on here. We're going to talk about the Kentucky Master, uh, Master Naturalist Program. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. So. Also, Ellen, do you, do you want to throw up the flyer on? Um... Sure, let me share that. So we are excited to share that we have a new program um, that's going to be starting soon, uh, the Kentucky Master Naturalist Program. Um, and uh, this spring, we're offering a training for county agents and staff and specialists and other extension folks to get them familiar with the program. Um, so uh, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Great. So we've got a um, training uh, series that's going to be just for them. Um, and if you like this show, I think you're going to love this program because it's everything about your natural world. Whether we're talking about um, the different ecological concepts, the different regions, um, botany, uh, wildlife, entomology, you name it, um, as well as the human interactions with those. So things like archaeology and how to be uh, safe and healthy when you're out in the woods and uh, outdoor learning environments and citizen science. Um, so it's going to provide just a little bit of information on all of these different things. Um, so our goal is that this spring we're going, or not this fall, we're going to have a public training of this program. And if you're interested, you'll get the opportunity to become a uh, naturalist volunteer in the state of Kentucky. So that requires completing um, an initial training of about 40 hours that covers those topics that I just mentioned, um, and then asks you to uh, volunteer, volunteer to get your initial certification as a naturalist volunteer. Volunteer, but then each year following to volunteer with different organizations in your area uh, and, and add to those natural areas. Uh, so if you're familiar with programs like Master Gardener, it's kind of along those lines, um, just with a little different focus. Yeah, very, very exciting. A great way to kind of learn about our natural world and kind of pay it forward. So I'm, I think you're already getting a great response from our county extension agents and staff out there. We are. And, and you know, this is something that a lot of different states have. Lori and I did not come up with this idea ourselves. Um, many of our neighboring states have these programs that I think are really beloved and uh, a great way to uh, get people involved, get them engaged. And so um, we're building on some pilot programs that were run in uh, Jefferson and Fayette County uh, by Carmen Agaritas. 
Chris and uh, other folks and want to give a big shout out to the uh, agents who've been involved in our planning process on this as well. Um, Wayne Long, uh, Eric Comley, Dan Allen, and uh, Jamie Dockery. Um, and so we're trying to put together something that uh, will build. And um, if you're interested, if you want to learn more, you can reach out to myself and Lori, and we'll add you to um, a mailing list to get more information as this, as this unfolds. And this is a virtual event. Yes, this right? is going to be virtual uh, for the time being. We would love to do it in person, and maybe in the future we'll get to do uh, some field dates. But for right now, we're going to cover the basics with those extension folks. Um, and then in this fall, we're hoping to do another virtual version uh, with everyone welcome to sign up. All right. Wonderful. Well, thanks it's, for letting us know about that. Yeah, you know, very cool program. Great job. Point out that it, there's 17 different sessions and each session is different so it's a great learning opportunity even if you decide you don't want to go any further it's a great opportunity to to learn about the archaeology the eco regions of Kentucky and stuff so I, it's exciting yeah. wonderful yeah thank you all for your efforts to connect people to our natural world so much really it's really mm -hmm. cool. Thank you I love how you're going to teach share. agents first and then you're going to actually bring it on to the general public so that'll that'll be great so all of our agents, please sign up for it, you know. We're, we're going to have, have fun. A, it's going to be a blast. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I know. If you all are involved, it'll be great. All right. Sounds good. Right. Well, moving on to our wildlife sounds. Um, yes. Dr. Matt Springer cannot be here today, um, but uh, we did have an interesting show with him that um, him and I recorded, and uh, we can go ahead and get that started if you want, Billy. Yeah, so we're, we're circling back around to birds again. We are. <laughs> talking about birds, and we're going to come back. So um, without any further ado, I'll share the presentation. Welcome to another Wildlife Sounds from the Forest, and we have Dr. Matt Springer with us, and you have some interesting sounds for us today. Yeah, good morning, Renee. I've got a few that um, as we enter winter here, they're going to be more common if you're outside, especially at night. However, some of these you may even hear during the day at this point in time. Okay, so, let's take a listen. All right, so start this off. That one's pretty straightforward. I bet you a lot of people have heard it and most probably know what they are. Right, exactly. It's that it's that saying who cooks for you, who cooks for you all, right? right. So and it is our barred out. They're most very knows that sound. Yes, most people do. They're a very pretty bird. They're one of our larger owls, not our largest owl, but one of our larger owls and really common mm -hmm. in um both urban and rural forest settings. Okay. Right. So we're going to keep with a theme here. Okay. Right? So our next one. <laughs> hmm. Now, is that two different birds? Uh, it's, it's two different sounds, right? Mm -hmm. One right. is a much more common one that everyone hears, the hoo hoo, right? Right, that I understood. <laughs> but then you got, you got a little angry outburst in there, probably because oh, somebody was, was harassing them at some level. Uh, and that is, you know, our larger owl, our great horned owl, um, clearly identifiable from the tufts above the ears there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and uh, once again, common in both, you know, fairly common in both urban and rural settings. Uh, I had one in, that would hang outside my tree in uh, Lexington, um, and I still hear them, you know, out in rural parts of the state as well. And our last bird for today, because mm -hmm. we're kind of doing these in sets of three, following that Christmas theme of the goose and everything else. Right. Hmm. I know it's an owl because you said so, but <laughs> I would not have guessed that was an owl. Well, they make a couple other noises. This one's the, the song trill that you, you would probably hear now, and I have been hearing it. Um, it's, it's definitely not living up to its name. Mm -hmm. Um, and they are a tiny bird. And if you can actually see it here in this picture, it blends in quite well. Oh yeah, there it is. <laughs> you know, it's, it's our Eastern screech owl. Um, and this one is the gray phase. They have a tawnyish color phase as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, yeah, they're, they're a very tiny bird, a, 
um, in our probably our smallest owl that we have in the state. Um, if we don't have a lost solid owls come through, uh, but once again, common in urban and rural settings, uh, very much tied to trees. Uh, and I believe we have one that's been frequenting the arboretum, if not more than one, uh, that I see pictures of regularly on social media. Yeah, he blends in very well. It took me a minute to even find him. <laughs> yeah, if he was the red face, he would not have blended in as well with that whitish color silver bark. Right, um, definitely. So yeah, now these guys are uh, all very important in terms of ecological services. They eat a lot of rodents. Um, and the great horned owl and, and sometimes the barred owl can get themselves in a little bit of trouble sometimes with things like chickens uh, or, or ducks for poultry. Um, for those folks that have either backyard flocks or on a larger scale, even um, they get into the poultry houses. Mm -hmm. so, so what are their chicks called? I guess they're not called chicks. Uh, but... No, they're not called chicks. And this one's pretty easy. It's an owlet. And, oh, um, that, yeah, that's easy. <laughs> yeah, you know, And the real reason why you're hearing a lot of them right now is, and um, probably why you asked that is it, actually we're getting closer to breeding season. Um, these guys uh, are one of the first birds uh, like eagles and hawks they they start their nest pretty darn early in the, in the spring even you know really late winter mm -hmm. um, so you may come across um, especially in conifers where they're um, you know possibly nesting you'll see especially barred owls will be around and all of a sudden you'll hear you know you may see them staring at you for some reason and it's probably because there's a nest nearby right so. yeah so how many owlets do they have well that depends uh, the screech owl it can have up to six eggs in a nest Mm -hmm. The barred owl up, upwards of five and the great horned upwards of four. Um, but most of the time you've probably seen two or three. The screech owl, you might see four or five. Uh, I've, heard, um, I've heard of folks seeing uh, as many as six at one time, but usually it's uh, here about four or five the most. Um, it, it probably depends on the health of the parents and, and how much food they have that, you know, how many um, owlets are going to be able to make it longer into their lives. And, um, you know, it's, it, it, it really kind of depends on, yeah. on what's going on in that system. Yep. Mm -hmm. And do most of them nest in trees like that one you showed us, or do they have nests that they build? So uh, the barred owl and great horned owl will actually have uh, stick nests. Um, mm -hmm. Screech owls will uh, use cavities uh, uh, if they can't, or, or they'll actually are frequently found in wood duck boxes. Mm -hmm. um, but they will also, um, I don't know if they're solely a cavity nester off the top of my head. I couldn't tell you. Uh, but I know that when we would check wood duck boxes, we'd find them quite a bit. Um, and, um, you know, in the spring, sometimes you'd see a nest in it. Um, mm -hmm. It was not the most uh, fun thing to, well, it was really cool to open, but also not fun because all of a sudden you have outlets that are not very happy you were there. Not where you were expecting to be in the box. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> all right. Well, anything else you want to give us about owls? Uh, no, I, I, I mean, they're uh, quite amazing creatures with some really cool adaptations, with, you know, such as their feathers that allow them to have silent flight. And, um, remember that if you're using, um, any kind of, um, rodenticides that if there's owls around, they're going to be directly impacted by that. So make sure you follow the recommendations and, and use them inside, uh, to help eliminate any possible, um, exposure for these guys. Cause they, they do, uh, end up accumulating quite a bit of anticoagulants in them and they die from it. Yeah. So it's one of the reasons barn owls have actually been collapsing mm -hmm. uh, population wise. So um, just make sure you use wisely, wisely use those uh, rodenticides so that we can keep these guys around because they really do help us quite a bit with uh, rodent population control. You know, one thing I just thought of is that's always amazed me is how they can turn their neck. You know, yeah, it looks almost, like they go all almost, the way around. <laughs> almost completely around that. Yeah. It's, it's, um, you know, in, in essence, if they turn, if they can't make it all the way around one way, they can turn it the other way and they have complete 360 degree vision with that ability. Um, you know, and they have the larger eyes and the offset ears to help them find prey. It's, there's so many cool adaptations right, for sure. Definitely. Well, thank you for coming in and talking about owls. Great to be here. Thanks, Ray. You know, that's a segment, Billy, I always enjoy doing is the wildlife sounds. And, you know, I, I've been um, accused of having eyes in the back of my head for my daughter, but, <laughs> <laughs> but never the 360 motion, you know. <laughs> no, interesting stuff. And yeah, you and um, Matt do a great job with those segments. Thank you all so much for bringing them to our audience, for sure. Sure. It's just another little added touch that we like to do yeah. occasionally. And if anybody wants, you know, anything specific animal, please let us know. Uh, Renee, another great show. And, uh, you know, a big thanks to all of our viewers out there and as Renee mentioned you know we want this show to be supportive of what you all are trying to do um, and, and and inquiring about the natural world here in Kentucky so if you guys
got things you want us to see or, or talk about, um, please let us know. You can uh, visit us at fromthewoodstay.com. Um, there's a little survey link that you can um, submit kind of comments and um, suggestions that you'd like to see on the show. Um, so thank you all for being with us on a weekly basis. We really appreciate it. Yeah, we definitely appreciate everyone coming in and, you know, um, spread the word for us. Um, if you see us on Facebook, you know, go ahead and share that with uh, with the people that you are friends with on Facebook. And we would greatly appreciate that. Um, you know, we want to get the word out to anybody who um, who could benefit from watching the show. And again, like Billy said, it, you know, all of our past shows are on from the woods today dot com. So you can always um if, you know, if you're anything like me, you're like, man, I should have wrote that down while I was watching that. Well, you can always go to that website and um, scroll through it and try to find it. Well, again, folks, thank you all so much for spending a little time with us and trying to learn more about Kentucky's um, wildlife and woodlands. Um, they're beautiful. They're amazing. And, um, you know, we're glad that you all are wanting to learn more about them. Exactly. So get out there and make some winter wildlife treats now that you know how. And um, we will see you next week. Yeah. See you next week. Bye. Take everybody. Care.